I'm late! This week has been absolutely crazy, what with college assignments and crazy work schedules and getting ready for karate testing. I've just been completely overwhelmed by the number of things that I have to get done. So I'll just apologize right now for the fact that this video is two days late. Sorry. There's a lot of memes out there on the internet that refer to John and Sherlock as this sort of head-heart relationship, with Sherlock being the head and John being the heart. I've always liked this portrayal of the character because it shows both men as being reckless and clever and able to be brave in tough situations, but it highlights their differences. Sherlock is kind of the cold, calculating, logical side of things. John is the heart of the matter. But that got me thinking, what exactly does it mean to be the heart of something? So I consulted probably the best known index that defines what the heart or love is of something. 1 Corinthians 13. This particular chapter of the Bible has a lot of terminology and definitions for things, so I went ahead and boiled it down to just a few key terms that define what love or the heart of something is. Patient, humble, selfless, rejoices in truth, and does not fail. So if we're going to call John the heart of this relationship, we're going to have to figure out how he fits into each of those categories. Patient is pretty easy. After all, he does put up with Sherlock Holmes on a day-to-day -day basis. Humility. John is clearly humble. In the very first episode, we see him perform an act that rescues another human being, but he doesn't take any of the credit for it. And while oftentimes he gets frustrated with Sherlock getting all of the glory, it's more for the fact of what it's doing to Sherlock's ego than the fact that he wants more of the glory for himself. So while John may have a bit to work on in this area because he does like to be praised for his contributions to their cases, he does have this sense of humility and being toned back and being okay with being a little bit more in the background on what they're working on. Selflessness. He gives up his comfort on a regular basis to go out and help Sherlock solve these cases in the service of other people. He regularly puts his life in danger in order to save another human being, often Sherlock. This includes a couple of particular cases where he explicitly intended to die on another person's behalf. The most prominent of these being in the great game when Moriarty is threatening to kill them both and they have the chance to stop Moriarty then and there. John willingly signals to Sherlock that he should in fact allow the bomb to detonate to stop Moriarty even though it would kill them in order to prevent Moriarty from hurting other people. This situation doesn't pan out but it does prove that John was willing and selfless enough to give up his life in the service of others. Rejoices in the truth. The very nature of what John and Sherlock do for a living is a kind of rejoicing in the truth. Their life's work is to bring people who are doing wrong to justice, to uncover what they have done, bring the truth to light so that that justice can be brought out. We often hear that Sherlock could have been anything that he wanted to be. But it's also true that John has a good profession ahead of him as a doctor. He could do many number of different types of profession that don't involve the sort of bringing the truth to light in them. So I definitely think we can count rejoicing in the truth in John Watson's character qualities notebook. Does not fail. Another term for this does not fail is faithfulness. And we can see John's faithfulness throughout the whole series. And in fact, in some ways, you could almost say that this story is about John and how much he sticks to Sherlock. Even when Sherlock can't do it, or Sherlock is in a rut, or Sherlock is being mean and crazy and cutting people out of his life, John is still there. He's still standing by Sherlock's side. He's still supporting him. He is faithful to the end. Over the course of the show, that line between head and heart in the John Sherlock relationship has gotten a lot more blurred. We can still see that John is kind of the heart of it and Sherlock is kind of the head, but especially in season three we see a lot more mixing of these head and heart qualities between the two characters. This leads me to my main observation from the episode The Reichenbach Fall. This is the last episode of the second season and one of the first times that we really see this mixing of the two characters. There's a scene in this episode when Moriarty comes to Sherlock's flat to visit Sherlock. 
something you have to realize is that John and Sherlock have very specific chairs. One chair is Sherlock's chair, and one chair is John's chair. When Moriarty comes to visit, Sherlock directs him to sit down in the chair opposite his own, which just happens to be John's chair. And Moriarty, being the contrary fool that he is, crosses and very purposefully sits in Sherlock's chair. This leaves Sherlock nowhere to go but to sit in John Watson's chair. Going back to our head and heart symbolism, what we've seen here is Moriarty is taking Sherlock's place in this dual relationship, and Sherlock is taking John's place. Moriarty is playing the part of the head, the cold, calculating reason, devoid of all of emotion, only interested in himself, not interested in others, seeking to obtain glory, seeking to obtain power, not caring about truth, only caring about his own gain. That is Moriarty, sitting in the place where Sherlock used to sit. And Sherlock is now sitting in John's place, the place of the heart, the place of humility and patience, seeking for the truth, selflessness, putting others ahead of himself. That's where Sherlock is sitting. Sherlock is forced into the position of the heart pitted against Moriarty who has taken his place as the cold calculating machine of the head. This scene sets us up for what occurs throughout the rest of the episode which is Sherlock having to fight directly against Moriarty on the grounds of humility and patience and selflessness and truth and being faithful. Sherlock Holmes never would have won the battle against Moriarty if it hadn't been for John Watson. He would have had no clue on how to perform these qualities that were so necessary for him to succeed. Without the example of the heart, John, he would never have known how to play that part. When Moriarty would have taken the place of the head, Sherlock would have tried to go against him head against head, and it all would have come crashing down around them. Without those heart qualities, Sherlock would have been no different than Moriarty. So yes, John is the heart of this friendship, and Sherlock is the head of the friendship. But as time goes on, just like in any friendship, the more time they spend together, the more their characters begin to mix, and the more they learn from one another. So I guess the moral of the story is, be careful who your friends are, because the people that you spend time with is going to change who you are as a person, and you want that to be for the better as it was in the case of John and Sherlock. So consider your story. Is there a time when you said something or made a decision that was so much like one of your friends that you were like, oh my goodness, that was such a so-and-so thing to do? Leave it in the comment section below. And let me know what you think of the new set. I got a new desk, put it together myself, and I think I really like the way it turned out. I like my poster over here. Plus, it's way easier to do homework with the L shape. I'm telling you, L shaped desks are the way to go. Also, if you're liking my videos, please subscribe and share it with your friends. I hope to see you again as our stories live on.